Hello there and welcome to my general defense guide for Dwarf Fortress. In this video I'm going to summarize and explain all the different methods that you have available to defend your fortress. Of course it's going to be quite a tough thing because Dwarf Fortress has a lot of different ways and means to defend your fortress and therefore I won't include any too detailed explanations with methods. Often I will skim some things with just uh, naming them because otherwise we'd be sitting here still tomorrow. If there are any questions just ask away or check out the other videos I've made. Lots of these things I explain more detailed in other tutorial videos. So that being said, this video has three parts. In the first part I'm going to talk about everything we can construct defense-wise. That means walls and uh, physical designs like this uh, loop here and all these things. In the second part, I'm going to talk about everything we can craft and train like traps and uh, military dwarfs and uh, siege engines and how to use them and where to use them. And in the last part, I'm going to talk about the uh, administrational things like assigning jobs correctly to stop risking your dwarf's lives unnecessarily, how to put up a good setup when you get sieged, which does not put your civilians into risk, and these things. All right, that's being said, let's get started with the first part. So when we want to talk about design, there's two things that I want to emphasize here. First off, sometimes you have terrain to work with, sometimes you don't. As you see, this fortress has been built in the middle of the plains. It has only one Z layer and is therefore pretty attackable still, but it's a pretty good and solid easy design that emphasizes a lot of things and we're going to work with that. In other scenarios you have something like a mountain that's way closer and you can take yourself inside and get yourself a, a nice fortification going like that. The key principles when you want to create a design are all about controlling the entrances and the exits of your fortress and that's what your primary thoughts should be about when you when you set up where to build up your fortress try to find a area where you can control the entrances accordingly and if there is nothing there build something out of it which brings me right to the next point i want to talk about all the different constructions that you can work with and what they bring to the table so Walls, as you see here, I have worked with them a lot, are pretty powerful. They can't be destroyed by any creature. You can only deconstruct them yourself. The downside of them is climbing creatures can't just climb them. They, uh, they can just climb above that and uh, crawl on in there. You can avoid that by just constructing either higher walls or putting a roof on top of this area. So basically, if we'd go one Z level up, and put floors on top of that, or even cover it up with a large bridge or anything like that, climbing creatures would be at a loss. But you need to take that into account. Wall's biggest weakness is that they are climbable after all. But beyond that, you can't really do anything against them. Or the enemy can't do much against them. Really worth mentioning here is also the fortification, which is something you can build or carve into a wall which allows your archers to fire through, but keep in mind enemy archers can do so too, but it requires really skilled enemies to be a real threat to your people. So all in all fortifications allow you to fire through, but the enemy don't walk to, uh, don't walk through. Besides that we have here also worked with bridges. I have replaced pretty much everything that I could work um, with doors or floodgates with bridges, because bridges are quite wonderful. Bridges can be linked to levers, and if we pull that lever, these bridges will transform into walls. These are drawbridges. They will be drawn up, and then they are practically indestructible walls. And you can use drawbridges to create diversions. But for example, here in the design, this is my main entrance in peace times. And when we get a siege, I flick this switch, and these bridges go up, the peacetime entrance is sealed and the enemy has to go through the very, very unpleasant area that I have prepared here. This way, you can have basically a, a ways and means to seal off your people if there's any doom incoming. I want to talk about floodgates and doors real quick. Why don't I use them that much? They are destroyable by building destroying entities like trolls and bigger monsters. So here it's a little bit of a abusive system. Bridges can't be destroyed. 
Just keep that in mind for your own immersion's sake. If you don't like that, just use doors and floodgates because I, I totally understand if that would break the immersion too hard for you. The other thing that we can do as a physical ways and means of defense is digging a moat. This is always a nice thing. You can do that by just digging the channel. Here, just take that command and then you can start and dig out a moat. Two things are really important to note when you want to do that. First off, don't go only ones at level deep. When you have dug out that thing, go deeper and dig it deeper and dig it deeper. At least two or three Z levels should suffice. Then when you want to go for a moat, water isn't the best solution because a lot of creatures can't just swim and when you get attacked by swimming creatures, your moat will just turn, it's just useless. And besides that, it does way more damage to fall into a deep chasm. It does way more damage if that deep chasm has spiky traps on the floor or something like that. You can of course use water because it's really easily available and keeps off enemies that can swim, but that being said, a moat is a, well, mediocre line of defense. It keeps away everything that can climb, fly, or swim, but sadly a lot of creatures can cross that defense. Therefore, it quickly turns into something that is more of a nuisance for yourself. But a moat with, uh, filled with water is a safe and accessible water supply, which is something to, to respect. So, the next point on my list is I want to talk about design-wise segmentation. What do I mean with segmentation? We go a little bit deeper so I can show you better. So, for example, when we go up here, this area will lead to the central city of mine. And this here is my mining entrance and the area where we also will access the caverns, ultimately. So, all in all, I have an area which I can link with levers and we can flick a switch and seal off this area entirely, which is really powerful because that means if ever something bad happens down there, which you have trouble containing, you can also go on over and build a wall in front of that and you have no more problems, except for the fact that you can't access the area until the trouble has been settled with. But it is a always a good way to keep areas of your fortress sealable. This goes even so far that I would even recommend you to make your civilian districts sealable, make certain areas of your of your hospital sealable. Basically, the more areas you can lock off in your fortress, the more micromanagement you have, but jokes aside, it gives you a lot of control. If you have a a, a lockable civilian district, let's say you have three different civilian districts and district one gets a lycanthrope like a werewolf or something like that. And you can just seal off District 1 and District 2 and 3 don't have to worry about getting infected. So it's really, segmentation is such a powerful defense tool and it's up to you how to use it. Here are just some, some really simple ideas, but I think you can already uh, get in, get into the idea, get behind my ideas here. So the next point is trap mazes. You can set up trap mazes quite decently and the wonderful part about it is you don't need to set them up right at the beginning. For example, in this fortress, when I started out, as you see here, this was my main entrance at the beginning. This was uh, really not too well defended. My kitchens and my starter farms are really accessible for the enemy there. And it started here where we get where we started with a decent defense. But just like I showcased before, we have installed the, uh, the switch here a new staircase has emerged and our enemies now have to cross an alternative pass, uh, pathway which will ultimately lead back into the main uh, pathway. This sort of trap mazing is really really powerful and you can, as you see there, implement these even after your starting design has turned out to be a little bit weak. So that ends the first part of this video. We can of course bring so many more design ideas into that. I just wanted to give you a couple of general ideas. I hope I have covered the most here. If you feel like I have missed a spot, feel free to leave that in the comments. So let's talk about the gear defense, how I like to call it. So traps, military, siege weapons. So traps are simply explained. Stonefall traps, they lob a boulder on the enemy. They don't hurt your dwarves. Weapon traps, they utilize weapons that can be installed. You can also make trap parts for these. They basically get sprung by the enemy, they chop them apart, then they reset automatically unless they get jammed by a corpse, and 
go again if somebody goes over them. They are highly effective, they are basically the gold standard when you want to go for lethal weapon traps, and they also don't hurt your dwarfs. Cart uh, cage dwar uh, traps are working like that. Everything which fits into a cage, they press that uh, plate, they get caged, and they are diffused. Super powerful. You can use that to either keep enemies out of your way or to just uh, collect creatures. Just keep in mind if the enemy is too large it won't go into a cage. Unless the cage is webbed, but it's a different story. And these spikes, well, you can use them either for kill rooms or for staffing out moats like here. A couple of upright weapons or spikes would be really, really nice. And they can be utilized with either spears or nasty spikes that you can craft at the metalsmith and the like. So these are the basic things that you can work with trap-wise. And as you see here, the implementation is relatively simple. You just put them on a pathway where you force the enemy to traverse. It's really not more, more, not more behind that. Here I use a huge card of rock ball traps, mostly because this fortress has no access to metal. Otherwise, this would be also littered with weapon traps. So, all in all, when you're using weapon traps, keep in mind the quality of the weapon matters, and up to 10 weapons can go onto one grid. This is really, really powerful. Alright, but enough about that. This is pretty self-explanatory. I want to go in the next point over siege weapons. So, you know, these, these wonderful little things that you have here in the military. So, first off, I have a own, a own video about siege weapons, how they are used. Catapults are training weapons. Really, they, they are not that good to kill off stuff. Ballistas are the weapons that you can kill enemies with. Siege weapons are ideally fired in a straight line, and they are super deadly. Friend and foe. So, use it in narrow corridors. For example, this area would make it a, a perfect ballista range. Put in two fortifications here, and then in the background, uh, behind there, we have ballistas mounted, and then we have... E we, we could even let the dwarves use the ballistas without giving the enemy any chance to charge them, because through the fortifications that would be sitting here, behind that are the ballistas the enemy has no chance to access. Siege weapons are relatively hard to put up. They are costly, they require lots of wood, you need catapult training for your siege operators to make them really powerful. But at these narrow passages, a proper setup of ballistas, if you have made them correctly, can be absolutely devastating and can hold off entire armies. Just have to put it up uh, properly. Narrow corridors like these are really a good fit for that. And of course, last but not least, we have to talk also about, no, not, not the last point, <laughs> Um, we also have to talk about military. Military is your best friend in terms of defense, of course, when attackers come up. Few thoughts about military. It's a good idea to put your barracks as close to the ground or as close to the caverns as possible, wherever you expect enemies to launch from. So, surface-based barracks have another advantage. Dwarves hate sunlight. It really hurts them, and they, they get dizzy. Sometimes they even have to vomit. And the more training your soldiers have in the broad daylight, the less vulnerable they are to that. Therefore, if you have a squad that has to work a lot on the surface, let them train near the surface, let them patrol over the surface, because you can't here set up uh, patrol routes with these, and give them as much sunlight as possible, because this way they'll get acquainted to that, and they will be more effective. Apart from that, how military works, we all know that it's a little bit more complicated, but whenever there's any enemy left standing after your traps, military can come in the way, or you just do it via military. There's, it's an old topic. So, I want to talk about complex traps now as the last thing in this video, because I feel like complex traps are the bread and butter. So, complex traps, with that I mean things like cave -in traps, or, or Doberman bombs, or, or magma traps, water traps, whatever. So, however you want to set up your defense layout, just keep in mind that there's always a good way, a good idea in diverting your enemies into areas where you can set up complex traps. So, for example, I do plan to make this area here 
go more into that direction. And then when I browse up, here I have an entire layer. Oh, well, here it's a little bit aquatic, but let's ignore that. Let's let's pretend the aquifer wasn't around. I would have an entire level above, which I could use for all nasty kinds of nasty technical devices that could rain from above down below. Or I could set up a room here like that with a pitfall trap below because I have several levels below that I can work with. So whatever you want to do, complex traps require space above and space below, and you should really try to get that into your planning. Complex traps, I have lots of other videos about that, like how to set them up is not the matter here. So let's get up to the third part of this video because the gear part of the defense is really covered with that. You have traps, complex traps, siege weapons and military. That's, uh, that's the tools that you can use. So let's go for the really interesting part about let's stop our dwarfs from suiciding. So first off, Water supply and fishing are two really, really common cases of death. So what I did here is I have made a fishing zone here and I have, I have went to the standing orders and they can only take water from, designate, from designated zones and they can only fish in designated zones. In your defense system, ideally, when you want to seal yourself up entirely, Pay attention to a water supply inside your fortress because your wounded will require water at some point. Except for that, water ain't that interesting in the first place. It's just really good to know that your fishers don't kill themselves anymore if you put a zone somewhere safe-ish or you just uh, make a own area where they can fish for that design is, um, in particular. So, the next thing that I want to talk about are pastures. Pastures are a crazy thing. You can use them to create safety for your fortress. Because they are stealthy enemies, but if you, say, put a pasture zone like uh, in this area here, and then you put lots of critters like cats, dogs, and the like in here. I have put uh, my, star my, my pastures like that here. Animals have a high tendency to spot stealthy enemies, and this is a really nice early warning system to keep thieves out of your fortress, because lots of enemies are entirely immune against traps. This uh, pasture trick is a nice way to get these uncovered, but keep in mind most of these animals are sacrificial lambs and they will get killed, so you should probably only use animals that you actually want to get rid of. So. On the other hand, you can use this uh, pasture thing, of course, to quarry, uh, to to uh, to bring up lots of defensive animals in one zone, especially when you have narrow corridors like these, or in this area, this would be also nice. You can, of course, also put up a cage and transfer animals for your defense inside there which can then be released via a lever or a uh, pressure plate. You can use animals definitely also very, very nicely for your fortress defense. But the emphasis that I want to put up here is you should always have an idea where to put your animals during a defense because that's really, really important. The next thing how you can keep your civilians safe is use burrows. So with this little trick here, we go down here to our civilian area and we add a new burrow and now we drag and drop that all over the place except and then you go on over here and select all civilians and now all civilians are assigned to that burrow this makes it hopefully impossible for them to get to the surface i have heard that there are some janky bugs up there but this is uh, the burrow's designation is really useful in the time of attack to minimize the amount of civilians upstairs that's one thing and among the standing orders i want to point out the uh, sieges and forbidding th settings here forbid hunted dead and death items and such things here i have a very very high security layout sorry i right clicked accidentally here i have a uh, very high security layout basically the idea of it is the basic settings allow everything which dies on the on the battlefield to get looted Im immediately this leads to a army of hauling dwarves 
standard settings that get themselves pretty much into danger and you don't want that. These settings here allow you to get to put a stop to that. So yeah, that's what I had on my list. Of course, there are tons of things that you can do extra, more and whatnot. I want to close this video with one valuable thought though. This game has enough defense methods to make it almost impossible for your enemies to cross your traps. If you have this area roofed up and trapped up, it can even destroy flying enemies. If there are forgotten beasts made out of steel and whatnot, you can kill them with cave-in traps. There's basically a, a, a tool for every problem, but if you seal up yourself too hard, you might kill the fun of your fortress, because Thor Fortress has no ultimate goal. It's all about restarting with the new ideas, and sometimes too much defense can kill the fun in your fortress. So. I know that this video was pretty has has skimmed many areas and I could have gone way deeper but it was a hell of a hard job to focus on the most necessary topics. I'm very sorry if you felt like I missed a very important spot. Feel free to add it into the comment section then we have a talk about it because I love to have the comment section rich with additions to these videos. It helps everybody and I appreciate you folks a lot. With that being said, leave a thumbs up on that video if you enjoyed because it makes it more visible for everybody else. Consider subscribing, I'd be delighted to have you. There's still 80% of people watching these videos who are not subscribed yet. And I hope you have a wonderful day, everybody, and see you soon.